Okay. All right, we are recording, we are live. Uh, everybody should be able to see me and hear me as well as seeing the slide on the screen. Uh, audio and video through clearly? Full chat. Yes. Awesome. All right. Let's go ahead and get this kicked off. Okay. So welcome to Structural Analysis again. We're on Lecture 3. Uh, just a couple quick housekeeping items. So Homework 1 was due today. Uh, hopefully everybody uploaded that uh, to Blackboard. Uh, I checked a little bit ago. It looked like most of you uh, had done that. And hopefully you found that was a pretty straightforward assignment, not too terribly difficult. Um, are there any questions, though, uh, about any of this? And again, you can always uh, send me an email or, you know, uh, send me a question via Teams. Uh, anything, uh, any of those uh, are fine. Any questions about any, uh, classification or modeling? Yes, sir. Did you have a question? My microphone is having a problem or or is it my is it my microphone or or yours? Okay. Well, if you need to log off and log on, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get uh, get kicked off. Um, so uh, today what we're going to uh, do is we're going to start our first what I would call real structural analysis uh, topic, and that's the topic of support reactions. So what am I talking about with support reactions? And, and I, you know, we've kind of talked about this last time, but basically I'm talking about the forces that are applied to the structure externally that keep the structure in equilibrium. And so uh, they're, they you know, are, are applied at our boundary conditions. So I have here on the slide our three uh, primary boundary conditions that we'll be dealing with uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the semester, and that's our uh, hind or our pinned boundary condition, our roller, and our fixed condition. And to solve uh, these uh, systems, we're going to be using our equations of equilibrium. Now, one thing I don't have here on this slide, but what's incredibly important, is that we're, uh, from here on out, and when I say here on out, I mean really for the next, I don't know, maybe nine weeks or so, we're maybe more, we're going to be dealing solely with uh, problems that are determinate. So if you compute the IE value for every one of these structures, you're going to get an IE value of zero, and it's going to be stable uh, as well. Uh, we're going to start off with a really basic problem, and it's really to shake the rust off from, from statics, uh, as well as to introduce sort of the way that I do things, which is uh, a hopefully, a, it's a lot less formal, but it's a lot more straightforward. The way I like to describe it is that we use uh, simpler tools in this course to handle more complex structures. That's, that's kind of the idea. But we're going to start off with a really basic problem today, and, and we're, we've, got, we've got actually two examples we're going to do today. But we're going to start simple, and by the end, we're going to have hinges and moments and triangular loads and all this crazy stuff. And you're ultimately going to see how problem one is really no more difficult than any of the other problems we're about to do. So let's get right into it. So I have here a beam, and, and I, I throw, threw some terminology in here. This is simply supported. And when I say simply supported, I mean a beam that has a hinge boundary condition or a pinned boundary condition on one side and a roller on the other. And so that's what we mean by simple supports. And I have on this beam, I have three concentrated forces. I got a 20 kip load, a 30 kip load, and an 18 kip load. And what we're going to do is we're going to compute the support reactions at A and B. Okay. Uh, now to do this, uh, a couple of things. Let me stop. Uh, uh, let me stop my share real quick. Don't worry. I'm going to pull the problem back up here in a second. Um, so I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pull up my, uh, my OneNote, the problem, do, uh, to do it on the board, I guess you should say. Uh, in order to do that, I may, uh, it, it might be um, a little difficult to, to see the chat. 
And so if you have questions throughout the problem, make sure and use either your microphone or maybe the raise hand feature. I'm not sure if, if I minimize the browser, if I'll be able to hear it, but don't hesitate to interrupt me and say, hey, I don't, I don't understand what's going on. Or, or if you got a question, I'm, I definitely want to be addressing those. So if you need to use your mic, uh, please do so. If I don't see the chat, I, I apologize. So I'm going to share my entire screen. So it's going to cascade here in a second. There goes the cascade. And then I'm going to pull up the problem. Okay. So let me put my screen down. Okay. So here's our, our beam. Uh, hopefully you've got some, some notebook paper or whatnot uh, next to you. I'm actually just going to give you a sec if you need to just copy that down. If you need to, to draw it out, I'm going to give you a minute. I'll give everybody a, a little bit longer. All right, we'll go ahead and, and move on. And, and it, don't hesitate if during class, if you need more time to write this stuff down, that's fine. Remember though, we've got all the, the notes are accessible via Microsoft Teams. Okay. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this problem and I see I've got some reactions. This first example, I'm going to kind of sort of walk everybody through it. And then the next one, I'm going to have you all help me out a little bit more. Okay, so let's start off with this. Okay, so we've got this uh, problem. We've got a roller at B and a hinge at A. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start off at A. And I'm going to recognize that there's a reaction here, a vertical reaction. Sometimes I, I draw my unknown reactions with a little line through the arrow. And we're going to call this AY. Now, right off the bat, I'm drawing this reaction acting upwards, okay? And this is something to mention right, right off the bat. Um, I'm drawing it upwards because I'm, ma I'm making an initial assumption that it, act, it acts upwards. If that's wrong, if my assumption is wrong, it doesn't mean I need to develop significant emotional distress about that. All that means is, is that my assumption was wrong and it acts downwards. And the way that you'll find that out is if when you go through your math, you'll find that AY is negative, okay? So right off the bat, you have to make an assumption, but it's okay if that assumption's wrong. It'll just come out negative, and it means, you know, it's going downward. So we're going to draw Y going up. We're going to draw BY going up. And we've got also AX. Remember, the pinned uh, connection here on the left has a horizontal reaction. I'm going to draw that going to the right, although it's probably pretty easy to guess what that reaction will be. Okay. So... We've got three uh, unknown reactions that we need to solve for. So now we're going to go back to statics. Let's, let's recap some of the, the basic statics that we need. Okay, so we've got three equations of equilibrium. Sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces uh, in the y direction, and sum of moments about, you know, an arbitrary point. Okay, so... Like I said, I'm going to walk everybody through this problem first. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to apply the sum of moments. Okay, now let's let's recap some basic statics. Okay, so first off, um, we've got three unknowns. We've got these three equations. I'm going to use the sum of moments expression first. When I sum moments, typically what I want to try and do is I want to try and be a little strategic about it, be a little crafty about it, if you would. Um, if I sum moments at A, and I could sum moments at B as well, but if I sum moments at A, there's a little bit of a strategic advantage there. Because if I sum moments at A, two of my unknowns go directly through A, the AX and the AY. So if I sum moments at A, I could easily solve for that unknown at B. Now, to be clear, you can sum moments anywhere. I can sum moments here or there, or there, it, do, it doesn't matter. I can sum moments anywhere about the structure, but it's easier to sum moments at A because two of my, my forces are, will go right through A. Uh, I heard a little beat. Give me a second.
Yes, exactly right. It's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, we, we eliminate as many unknowns because we place our, where we're summing moments, we place that point, you know, where those moments intersect. And so we could do that at A, we could do it at B. And some structures, we have a couple different options. Uh, that's, a, that's a great way of saying it. Okay. Now, here's where things are different. I don't, you know, uh, 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 use uh, uh, system parameters, or I, and I actually don't write it out as an equation. See, when you're summing forces, let's, let's take a, a simple one. Let's say you're summing forces in the y direction. All you're saying is that everything going up has to equal everything going down. When you sum forces in the x direction, all you're saying is that everything going to the left has to equal everything going to the right. And with moments, all you're saying is that everything spinning counterclockwise has to equal everything spinning clockwise. So the way that I do that is I just draw myself a little table. And I put everything that's going clockwise on one side and everything that's going counterclockwise on the other. And I just go through the structure, you know, a load at a time and, and write the response. So let's start off. So starting at the left and working my way towards the right, I have AX and AY. I don't need to put that uh, in my table because they go directly through A. So the, their moment contribution is zero. So let's start off with that 20 kip load. Okay. So I'm, I'm summing moments at A. So I ask myself, okay, first off, that 20 kip load, does it contribute moment at A? Yes. Does it, uh, so then I ask, well, what side of the table does it belong on, the left side of the table or the right side of the table? And if you look, that 20 kip load is contributing moment clockwise. So I'm going to put that 20 kips right here, 20 kips. And then I ask myself, how far is it from A? And that is six feet. And that's it. And I just keep doing that for the, uh, for the entirety. Now I'm going to move this over here a little bit, a bit more room. There we go. Okay, so 20 kips times six feet, and then I keep going and, and, and progressing. So what about the 30 kips? Well, does the 30 kip contribute moment? Yes. What side of the table? Again, left side. Now, how far is it from A? Somebody in the chat or somebody in the chat or somebody with their microphone tell me. What how far is it from A? 15. 15 feet. 15 feet. There we go. Yeah, I might have to ask you all to do that with your bike, folks. I'll, I'll be hopping back and forth. <laughs> okay. Next, we've got the 18 kips. Again, it contributes moment. Somebody else, how far is it? Anybody? Um, 22 feet. There we go. 22 feet. And there's all there is to it to do this. Now, we've taken care of the AX and the AY because we didn't need to worry about it. The 20 kips, the 30 kips, the 18 kips, we're done with that. And what about the BY? Well, the BY contributes moment, but it doesn't belong on the left side of the table. It belongs on the right side of the table because we have it drawn upwards. And so if you're at A and that's B, it's going like that. So BY and then What's our moment arm from A? Well, that one's pretty easy because it's given to us. That's, or it's, it's explicitly drawn out. That's 30 feet. And, and that's all there is to it. And so what do I do? I just sum up everything on the left and sum up everything on the right and, and set those two equal to one another. Because that's all you're doing when you're saying sum of moments equals zero. You're saying everything spinning clockwise has to equal everything spinning counterclockwise. So let's do ourselves a little bit of quick mental math. So 20 times 6, 20 times 6, that's 120. 30 times 15, 30 times 15, that's 450. And then 18 times 22, I might have to break out a calculator for that one. Do, 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 do. Comes out to 396. And so 120 plus 450 plus 396, you go through and you plug and chug that out and you get 966. Oh, let me get my black ink for that. And then uh, what are the units for that? It's foot times kip, so it's foot kips. Or kip feet, foot keep, or foot kips or kip feet. I tend to go with foot kips, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and that's everything on the left, by times 30 feet on the right. And so how do I solve for by? I just divide. And so everything cancels over here. And so I'm going to get BY equals a value. 
966 over 30. Somebody in chat, tell me what it is. Thirty-two point two. Thirty-two point two, but it's not thirty-two point two feet, it's thirty-two point two kips. Now, the first thing I'm gonna say, so so that is correct, it's thirty-two point two kips, but I'm gonna indicate that that was a positive answer. And because uh, that was a positive answer, that means that when I assumed that BY was acting upward, that was correct. And so that's thirty-two point two kips acting upwards. Okay. And that's all there is to it. So BY is solved for. So we'll say equals, oh, 32.2 kips. And sometimes I'll just put a little K there just for shorthand. Okay. Now, we've exhausted our sum of moments uh, equation. And so to be consistent, we want to make sure we use all three. And so now I have an unknown force in the y direction and an unknown force in the x direction, and I have sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction. So this is going to be pretty easy. So we start off with some of the forces in the y direction, and I do a very similar thing. I draw myself a little table, and I say everything going up, You've got to equal everything going down, and I just start listing all my forces and making sure I go through the whole structure. So start all the way at the left. Do I need to deal with AX? No, that's a horizontal force. I'm talking about verticals. What about AY? Yep, I need to deal with AY. And I have that drawn upwards, so I put it on the left. What about uh, the, the remaining forces, the 20 kips? I got that going down, and I'm just going to draw 20K. 30 kips going down, 18 kips going down. What else? Well, I've got BY. BY is going up, but I already saw for BY, so I'm going to say BY. But I already know that that's 32.2 kips. And so AY plus 32.2 kips equals everything on the right. And what do I have on the right? 20 kips plus 30 kips plus 18 kips. That's 50 and 18, 68 kips. Here, I'll, I'll just do K. And therefore, AY, just subtract the 32 or 32.2, so 68 minus 32.2, that comes out to positive, was that 35.8? And so that's 35.8 kips going upwards. And so that's some of, we've taken care of some of moments, some of forces in the y direction. Last one is some of forces in the x direction. Now, for this problem, I'm going to draw my table out just to be consistent, but I'll be honest, I probably won't do this past this problem. We put everything on the left and everything on the right. What do I look? I look at my structure. What do I got? I got AX going to the right, and I don't have anything going to the left. So AX is zero. So what's my answer? AX is zero. A Y is 35, ooh, I can do better than that, 35.8 kips, and it's going upwards, and B Y is 32.2 kips going upwards. Oh. Come on. A and S, just shorthand for answer. And there we go. Here, let me move this one down. This is my. This is our next problem. There we go. All right, I'm going to leave this up here for a second. Uh, give everybody a sec to catch up, and then we'll uh, go back to the slides. Uh, but I also want to give everybody a chance to see if they have any questions. Um, I don't want to move forward if there's anything that's a little fuzzy or a little funky. I want to make sure everybody's uh, clear on this. So I'll give everybody a sec.
All right, everybody good? All right, let me go back to the uh, collaborate. There goes the cascade. Uh, Anybody have any, do you have a question? Not, it just seems like a nice static refresh. All that that's th that's kind of where where we start out is is a, is a statics refresher, but we do it a little differently. We don't do any we won't have any IJK or, or anything like that. Um, we just we keep the tools simple, but the problems get more complicated. Um, but actually, they really don't. The, that's the sort of the kind of the point is that they may seem complicated, but they're but they're really not. I like the table method too. I've always been a fan of it. Okay, let me put prop the screen up a little bit. I won't, I would not recommend it. <laughs> I would not recommend making it. Uh, I would not recommend banging your head <laughs> against the wall. Um, although I, I may take that personally because I'm teaching a section of statics this semester. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. So what we did in this previous example, so let me go, go back to this. Uh, this previous example, I didn't really talk about this. So I, I wanted to take a step back and make sure that we're clear on this is if you look at this example, I've got three loads and we call those concentrated loads. Sometimes I'll call them point loads, but uh, what formatting are you talking about? You said, is that formatting required? Uh, are you talking about using the table? Uh, oh, that's a great question. Um, I am not a format authoritarian you could do the problems however you want and as long as you're doing them correctly and using the appropriate like if you're doing it correctly I, I'm, I'm fine with you writing a table I'm fine with you writing it as an equation either one's fine um, as long as it's clear I, I'm fine with however you want to do it I've just I, the, the table methods kind of been how I did uh, how I do it just so I can keep track of everything on the structure I can say okay here's everything going up here's everything going down uh, but you can do it either way. No, no worries. Okay, so in that problem, we we had what are concentrated loads, and concentrated loads are basically just lumping the force at a single location. So I've got you know a load that's fifty thousand pounds, and I'm saying it acts right here. Okay, that's a concentrated load. And to be clear, there are places in structural engineering where that's appropriate, but you can also model loads as distributed loads. Instead of lumping the load at you know, a single point, like it's 50,000 pounds right here, we can spread it out over a given area. And I want to give you a real life example as to why we would do that. Okay, so let's say for the sake of discussion that we were talking about designing or analyzing a building. And it doesn't really matter what the building is, but for, for the sake of discussion, we'll say it's it's like a like a hotel and we're looking at the ballroom, the area or the conference center where we have a bunch of people collected all at once, okay? Well, if I'm a structural engineer, I'm certainly not going to go and say, okay, this person weighs 190 pounds, this person weighs 170, this person weighs 230, this person weighs 194, and so I need to collect all those loads and put them on the floor. That doesn't make sense for a number of reasons. One, people move, and two, that group of people might leave and a whole other group of people might come in the next day. So how do I appropriately design that floor system to safely carry that load? Well, one of the answers is to use design codes. And so next semester, if you all decide to take concrete design or steel design, we'll talk a little bit more explicitly about how you design that. But the long story uh, short is that, you know, we have to select a load that is appropriate for what we're designing. In other words, if I'm designing a ballroom, I'm going to use different forces than if I was designing a hospital or a school or, or, or what have you, because they experience different things. So uh, a, a more specific example, let's say I was designing an office building. Well, I use a lighter load for the offices than I do the hallways, because the hallways have more people congregated all in, in, in the same space. So the hallways will see a heavier load than the offices do. And, and hopefully that, that analogy makes sense. But, but again, the second thing is because all the people move around, I, I'm not going to apply a single, you know, a series of point loads. Instead, I'm going to apply this as a distributed load. And the way that we do that from a, a code specification standpoint is we act as if the floor has one big pressure load applied to the whole thing. And so that pressure load would change depending upon what you're looking at. 
a ballroom might see 100 pounds per square foot or 150 pounds per square foot, whereas a classroom might only see 50 pounds per square foot. Classrooms are not as crowded as ballrooms, so the load in a ballroom is going to be a, a bit larger. Now, what that means is, is that the, the classroom is experiencing, you know, or the ballroom is experiencing this pressure load but each of the beams that support that floor are sort of seeing it as this distributed load, like you see here in this image here. So here on the left, you can see this pressure load applied to the floor, but each of the beams that hold that floor up see a distributed load. And then you can see the reactions on the end. Those reactions are concentrated loads. And so it's sort of like a hip bone connected to the leg bone. The beams frame into the girders, the girders frame into the columns, the columns go to the ground. And so you go from a pressure load to a distributed load uh, to concentrated load. So you kind of have to be able to assess both as a structural engineer. Now, so what I mean by a distributed load is a distributed load is that instead of it being lumped into a single point, we spread it out over a given area. But there's more than one way to spread it out, okay? Uh, instead of spreading it out like we did on the previous slide, the previous slide, we see how they're like constant, like they almost look like rectangles, like right here you can see this is kind of a, a or I'll use my little pencil here, how this kind of looks like a rectangle. Oh my God, that's horrible. I'm using my mouse, so, so please forgive me for my horrible artwork. But that kind of looks like a rectangle, okay? We, call it, we have a name for that. We call that a uniformly distributed load. And so we can distribute loads all sorts of ways in structural engineering, but the two primary ways that we see this in real life is as a uniformly distributed load or kind of what looks like a rectangle and a linearly distributed load, which looks like a triangle. So we can see either this type of load here that kind of looks like a rectangle or this one that looks like a triangle. And I'm sure some of you are like, oh, come on, Dr. Mike, do you really see this stuff in real life? Do you actually really see a triangular load in real life? And the answer is yes, you do. There's a couple of real life examples where an engineer would have to deal with a triangular load. And I wanted to provide those because I'm, I'm really a, a real life type of guy when it comes to my classes. I try and not cover, you know, especially when you get into your upper level courses like structural analysis and steel and concrete, I try and make sure that what we're talking about is very applicable in real life. Um, so if we're going to talk about triangular loads, it's got to have an application. One of the applications is what we call hydrostatic effects. And so um, if any of you are in fluids right now or are going to take fluids later, you'll learn that the pressure from a fluid and that fluid could be anything, but let's say we're talking about water, um, is the, the pressure increases as a function of depth. And so the deeper you get, the more pressure is exerted. And if anybody's done scuba diving or anything, would, would be able to uh, understand that. Well, if you have something like a dam or something retaining that water, that dam is going to experience that load as a triangular force. So that is a real life uh, uh, example of that. Another uh, real life example is through what are called snow drifts, okay? And so let's say you have a building and you have a roof on that building and let's say you have a roof and maybe you have a section on the roof where it's a little higher or you have an appurtenance on the roof that contains all your uh, uh, ME equipment, your mechanical and electrical equipment for the building. Uh, and, and let's say you get snow on the roof. Well, you know, the snow is, you know, most commercial roofs are largely flat. Like, for instance, the roof of this building uh, is flat. I mean, it's it has enough of a slope to drain, but it's not like a house where it's, you know, got this, you know, uh, so, you know very high pitch. Most commercial building roofs are, are, are fairly flat. And so you're going to have a flat snow load that, like you see right here, you've got this flat snow load, and you also have a flat snow load right here. But if anybody's been outside when it's snowing, you know that when it's snowing, it's also windy. And so not only do you get this snow blowing on the, um, or this snow on the building, but you also uh, get the wind. And what the wind can do is pile the snow up the side and you get this sort of triangular distribution of loads. So I promise you that, that when you see these triangular loads, that, like, we actually do see them in, in, in real life. So I wanted to make sure that that, that, that was uh, reflected. Now, going back to the review of statics, how do we handle distributed loads and how do we handle these linearly distributed triangular loads? We do that 
through the centroid. Okay, so what we can do is if we ever have a distributed load, we can idealize that as a point load, as a concentrated load, and just put that load at the centroid. And it's really, really simple. So let's take this case here on the left. Let's say I have a distributed load that's, I don't know, two kips per foot, and it's six foot long. Well, two times six is 12, and so this F here, I would just say I have a 12 kip load right here in the middle. And I'm putting it uh, on the centroid because it's I'm idealizing it as a rectangle. And if you remember, where is the centroid of a rectangle? It's right smack dab in the middle. So just one half the distance each way. Now, if I have a triangular load, I do the same thing, although, again, you got to think area is in centroid. So what's the area of that triangle? Well, it's base times height over 2. So i got to divide by 2 to get that magnitude force. Where do I put that load? Well, go back to statics and remember, where is the centroid of a triangle? Centroid of a triangle is a third of the way from the big end of the triangle. So, you know, for instance, if this length is, I don't know, 60 foot long, then this dimension here, this dimension right here would be 20 feet. This dimension would be 40 feet. Okay. That makes sense. Anybody got any questions about this before we move on to our second example? No problems here. Good deal. And so now let's look at this problem. Okay. And so one of the things I want to break in this class, that the misconception, is that, that this stuff is difficult. It, it really isn't. So if you look at example one versus example two, right off the bat, you example two, and you go, oh, my goodness. I've got distributed loads. i got point loads, triangular loads. The supports aren't in the same spot. i got one in the middle of the beam, one on the end. How in the heck do I do this? It's no different. This problem is just as challenging. And the point is, is that it's not challenging. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute the support reactions. Again, we're going to do a support reactions problem of this beam. We're going to call this is an overhanging beam. Okay. Um, one of the characteristics of overhanging beams is that usually what you'll find in normal loading cases is that this reaction here tends to be really big. And this one tends to be either a smaller reaction or depending upon where the loads are, it could be negative. You know, that this reaction could go down and this reaction goes up. And that can happen in overhanging beams. I'll go ahead and tell you, it won't happen here. They'll both be upward reactions, but this one right here at A ends up being pretty tiny compared to the other one. All right, I'll give everybody a sec to copy this down and then we'll, we'll bring the notebook back up. All right, let's um, let's go ahead and uh, I'm gonna stop this share and then pull the notebook up and the, the problem will be on the notebook. So let me stop this. And you'll get that cascading effect for a second. Yeah, for some reason, Collaborate doesn't like to share OneNote like it does other files. I'm I'm not really sure why, but not too terribly uh, a big deal. Okay, so let me, actually, let me do this. Let me give myself a little bit of room up top and let's lay that flat. Okay, all right. So here's our problem. Uh, it, uh, you all can go ahead and keep on copying it as we, uh, as we progress. Um, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna handle this the same way I handled, um, The other one, let me let me just make sure that's always up so that I don't have to keep going back and forth. That might be a little easier. Okay, um, so we're going to identify our reactions. I'm going to draw this one being upwards. We're going to call it BY. I'm going to draw this one upwards. I'm going to call that AY. And then we're going to call this horizontal one AX. Now, one thing I do want you to do 
uh, and all your problems. Like I said, I'm not a, a, a format authoritarian. I'm not going to make you do them the exact same way that I do them. But I do want an answer for all of your reactions. So, like, if you look at this problem, you can easily see that AX is zero. But I want you to go through the process of, of writing down, you know, putting an AX down and then identifying it as zero later. And the reason why is because real quickly, like maybe even starting Monday, uh, that won't be the case. You'll actually have a, a horizontal reaction there. And so I want you to get into the habit of checking them all to make sure that they're there because ensuring your structure is in equilibrium is probably one of the most important things you can do. Okay, so we've got our reactions. Now let's deal with our loads, okay? So let's start off with the load here on the right. Okay, so I've got this 10 kips. Now let's talk about this 1.5 kips per foot. Now this is a uniformly distributed load. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna treat that as if it's just a single load right there, just a single point load right in the middle. And I'm sort of drawing that as a dashed line, okay? Now, how much is that load going to be? What's the magnitude? Somebody tell me, either in chat or by microphone, what, what is the magnitude? If I've got 1.5 kips per foot over a distance of 22 feet. Uh, 33 kips. 33 kips. 33 kips. Exactly right. 33 kips. Okay. And I've also got to indicate where that is. Okay. So let's do it this way. Let's look at this dimension and this dimension. What are those dimensions? Either one, because it, it won't matter. Hold on. The cascade. 11. Yeah, there you go. Exactly right. This is 11 feet. Okay. And again, if for some reason, like the handwriting, if it doesn't come clear, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Let me know. Okay. Now we need to do the load on the uh, uh, on the uh, left. So I have 2.4 kips per foot, and it's linearly distributed over a distance of 15 feet. Let's first off talk about the magnitude. What's the magnitude going to be? Eighteen, exactly right. Eighteen kips, and and remember, and so the reason why is because it's F equals one half, fifteen feet, two point four kips per foot, and so one and a half times fifteen times two point four that ends up being eighteen. Okay. All right. Now let's put some dimensions on here. We'll do this long one first. What is this dimension? Somebody in the chat. Okay, so you said five feet. Okay, now here's the thing. The, the L over three, that's correct, but let me ask you a question. Okay, which one is the five feet? The one on the left or the one on the right? Yes, so this is the five feet. This is 10 feet, okay? So just make sure you're careful with that. It's always uh, uh, five foot from the big end, uh, 10 foot from the small, or, or, or L over three from the big end, uh, two L over three from the small end. So just make sure you get the, uh, the, the detail correct there. Okay, everybody good? All right, now let me see if I can risk a little more room. I wanna make sure I got a little bit of space here. Let's see if I can do this down here. So we're going to sum moments. Now, I'll go ahead and walk you through this one. Again, you could sum moments at A or at B. It doesn't matter. I tend to be the type that if I can sum moments from as left side of possible, I tend to do that just so I can start on one end and sort of work my way over. Uh, so I, I, I try and, you know, if I, if I had to choose, I usually just start at the left and work my way right. And again, I do my little table, but you don't have to. You can do it however you want. As long as you're doing it correctly and you get the right answer, I'm fine with it. Okay, so we keep on trucking. We do this like we did the last problem. So we have AX. Do we consider AX? No, because it goes right through A. What about AY? Do we consider AY? No, it goes right through, uh, right through A. 
So I'll do the first one, and I'm going to have you all do the other. Uh, the other. So we'll do the 18 kips. So the 18 kips, 18 kips goes on the left side of the table because I'm at A. It goes like that. So 18 kips. And again, I'll just do that, 18 kips. And then uh, our moment arm from A is only five feet. Okay, and so this is where, you know, you really want to make sure that you uh, uh, get your, your notes and your details appropriately, that you have your distance on the right place. Okay, 10 kips. Okay, I'll, I'll put the 10 kips on the side. 10 kips is going to go on this side. How far is it? What's my moment arm from A? Exactly right, 22.5. There we go, 22.5 feet, because it's the 15 feet and then another seven and a half, okay? Next force is BY, okay? BY, uh, help me out. Does that go on the left side of the table or the right side of the table? It should go on the right. There we go. And what's in my moment arm? Uh, 30 feet. There you go. 30 feet. And then our last one, we got the 33 kips. I think that one's pretty easy. It goes on this side. But now what's our moment arm? Make sure you get that one right. What's the moment arm? Let's see. I heard somebody in chat. 41. There you go. Perfect. Okay. And so that's it because there's no, no other forces on the problem. Again, that's one of the reasons I'm the fan of the table method is you just write it out. It's, it's, I've, I've always just, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just quirky. I always thought it was easier to skip a force when you wrote an equation. You know, you'd, you'd be writing it out and you'd forget one. Um, now we need to do a little bit of uh, math. So I just, I, I usually write my little numbers out here on the side just so I can make sure I did it right. It's 18 times 5. That's 90. Uh, 10 times 22 and a half, that's 225. And 33 times 41, I did this one in advance. That's 1353. I'm, I'm okay at mental math, but that one that one's pushing it even for me. All right, so 90 plus 22 and a half plus 1353 comes out to 1668. Now, the units for this, this is a moment, okay, and those are foot kips. Now, one of my little shorthand ways of doing that is I'll just write foot kips. Like I put the, maybe I'll put it here on the board so that it's right here. So it's like 1668, and then it's foot kips. That's sort of my little shorthand way of doing it, uh, just because I can be lazy sometimes when I write. Um, so if you ever see that, that's that's what that means. So that's a difference between foot kips and kips, right? And then by times thirty. So therefore, by equals what? What is by? Somebody in chat, help me out. Or somebody on the microphone, either one. Fifty-five point six. There you go, and that's positive. So what that means is we when we drew the, the problem, we have BY going up. And so when we got a positive number, that means that's correct. So 55.6, that that assumption going up, that was correct. See, if we had drawn BY going downward, what would have happened is the BY would have been on the other side of the table. And so we would have had 16, so if you all pull the camera up, you can see we would have had 1668 plus by times 30 feet equals zero so therefore we'd have here i don't need the therefore we would have 1668 equals negative by times 30 feet and so negative what was it 50 55.6 is by and so what that would have meant was uh, if we assumed it was going downward, we'd have gotten a negative answer, and that would have indicated that our assumption was wrong, and it was actually going upward. So that might happen. Like it's pretty easy on this problem that it, you know, I, we assume it's going upward.
But later on, we're going to have some problems where it's not so easy to determine whether or not it's going upwards or downwards. And so what a lot of analysts do is they just assume all the reactions are upward. And whenever they get a negative answer, it comes downward. And so that's something to think about because that's going to happen pretty soon uh, when we get to some more complex problems involving hinges and whatnot. All right. Next up, we use our other equations of equilibrium. We're going to sum forces in the y direction. So everything going up equals everything going down. I'm going to scroll up a bit so we can see everything. And so I just start at the left, work my way on over. So AY is going up, uh, 18 going down, 10 kips going down, BY, BY is going up, but I got a number for that, and that's, uh, was that 55.6 kips going up. And then I have um, uh, 33 kips going down. And so I have AY plus 55.6 kips equals, okay, so 18 and 10 is 28, 28 and 33, 61. And which, by the way, y'all can use calculators. I got no problem with that. I did all my calcs in advance, so... <laughs> I cheated a bit. So AY equals plus 5.4 kips. Solving that out, just subtracting. So 61 minus 55.6 is 5.4. Oh. I will get to that later, of course. And that is 5.4 kips going up. So if you remember, I said that like whenever you have an overhanging beam, uh, just, you know, from a reality perspective, what tends to happen is your middle reaction tends to be pretty high, and the one on the end uh, usually is either low or it, um, it can even go down. Now, that obviously depends on the loads that are on the beam and whatnot, but that's just something, you know, to think about. Uh, now, don't forget, I, and I do want to see this on assignments, that you do at least explore the fact that you've done sum of forces in the x direction, but if you don't want to write the table, if you just want to do ax is zero, that's fine too. I, I don't have a problem with that. So ax is zero, ay is 5.4 kips going up, and by is 55.6 kips going up. And that's it. That is that problem. I'll give everybody a sec to copy this down. And then if anybody has any questions or whatnot, you can throw them in the chat or just uh, by audio. I mean, uh, please, I want to make sure that this is clear. Because if you understand this, your homework assignment is going to be pretty doable. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I'm a numbers guy. I'm a numbers guy. Um, let me say this, though, in, in all seriousness. Um, one of the things that we're probably going to do later is we are going to learn how to derive analysis tools. Um, and that is going to be kind of symbolic. But again, there is a reason for that. So I'm actually going to pull up the, the uh, camera to kind of explain why. And if anybody needs me to go back to the book, I can. But remember, I'm using the Teams book as well. So let me pull something up. Uh, if any of you decide to take steel design, this is the AISC steel construction manual. This is the document that we use. Like this is kind of your textbook for the class. And when you open this book, there are some shortcut analysis uh, aids for what, what I'll call simple analysis problems. So uh, like a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load or, you know, this case or that case or whatnot. And when you look at it, there are formulas that, that you can use to do some shortcuts. But unless you understand where those formulas come from, they can be a bit dangerous to use. So I, I, we are probably going to have an assignment later on where we derive that. Uh, and another thing I will mention, uh, you know, we will be doing a little bit of calculus class later. But A, it's largely calculus you could do on your Casio. Uh, and B, it's really simple. But there, I mean, there are going to be some symbols later. But I'm a numbers guy. Don't, don't get me wrong. All right. Uh, any other questions before I pop up the homework assignment real quick, just to show everybody?
All right. So here's your homework assignment uh, for Monday. Uh, that's due Monday. Uh, like I said, we're going to have these uh, daily assignments. There's only two problems, very similar to the ones that we did uh, in uh, in class today. If you understand how to do what we did in class today, you'll understand how to do these problems uh, uh, with no issue. I will go ahead and tell you a couple things. One of the problems is actually in metric. Um, just to tell you, we will operate in metric very sparingly in this course. In fact, almost not at all uh, for two reasons. One, this course, it actually doesn't matter all that much whether you operate in metric or operate in SI because this isn't really a class where units become a super, super complicated issue. Uh, so whether we operate in one system or not doesn't really matter. But in design courses, particularly concrete and steel, the units do matter. And unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, it, it just is what it is. Uh, design specs are written in U.S. units, and so we primarily operate U.S. units in this class just because that's what the design specs are based off of. And when you go to Lowe's, you buy two by fours, two by fours are referenced in inches, and, and all the construction materials and whatnot we use in inches, so we, we operate in U.S. units. Um, but this is your homework assignment. Again, it should be pretty short. If you can do these two problems, you can do this assignment. Uh, I think it's, it might even be a little shorter than what we did in class today, but it's just to kick the rust off. Next time, what we're going to do is we're going to cover, um, I think we're going to do two things. We're going to see what happens when the loads are inclined and when the rollers are inclined. Uh, and then we might get into concentrated moments and cantilever beams, uh, which we haven't done yet. Uh, unless anybody has any questions, that's all I have for class today. Uh, but I'll give everybody a sec see if they have any questions. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, again, I uh, hope everybody's uh, enjoying the class and whatnot. Anybody uh, has any questions? Hold on. Is that the way most homeworks are? No curveballs. If you can do the examples, uh, then you can complete the homework. My opinion is that's how structural analysis is, period. Um, we like, and, and here's here's my point. Ask me that in a couple couple lectures once we uh, have gone through a bit more with reactions and we've had internal hinges and couple and concentrated moments and fixed ends and all these different things you'll find that it's not me that's making the homework easy it's that structural analysis isn't all that difficult um, I as for do I completely eliminate curveballs on homeworks um, I don't try and make things super confusing uh, I really don't um, uh, I mean I I'm going to challenge you, but I but I don't think I, I'm my my ultimate goal is to be fair, and so I think you'll find this homework is fair as well as the homeworks throughout the semester. I'm not trying to I'm really not trying to to curveball. I'm gonna try and make you think, but I'm not trying to trip you up. That would probably be the best way of answering it. All right, let me go ahead and stop the recording.